Thank you, Brother Dale. Good evening, friends. Good afternoon, rather. I seldom have the the service is always evening, so I get used to saying that. We are very happy to be here in the arena this afternoon. Every time I look across there and see those things and rings, I just think of how many, what a difference when I used to go out and box the man myself, and now I'm out fighting the devil. <laughs> just giving it to him with all I got. <laughs> and you know, there was one way that I found out in boxing, something I learned, was the technique of, of defense. You got to have a defense. And um, so that's a good thing. And the best defense that we have is the blood of Jesus Christ, isn't it? Just say it, thus saith the Lord, Satan, here it's written. That uh, does it. You know the word of God will defeat Satan anywhere, anytime, night or day, any place, the written word. And Jesus defeated Satan by the written word, showing that it could be done. That brings it to the, the baby Christian. No matter how small, how little, whatever more, you can say it is written. When Satan comes to Jesus, our Lord, and he said to him, If, that's the question mark, if thou be the Son of God, uh, uh, make these stones bread here, you can do it if you're the Son of God. And uh, now he said, uh, It is written. He never used his power. He said, It's written. It was written twice in the Bible, I believe, and uh, over in the Old Testament and in the Psalms. And he said, man shall not live by bread alone, by every word that see out of the mouth of God. Then again, he takes him up and said, uh, if you uh, fall down here or jump off this temple, why, he knows why. If he'd have done that without God telling him to do it, he'd, he'd killed him, wouldn't he? Sure he would. He was just a man. So he had to do what God told him to. Now, if God told him to get a friend jump off the temple, by what? How did Jesus work with the Father? By what? Vision. That's what he said, I do nothing except the Father chose me. So the Father hadn't showed him, and he knew better than to jump off of it, didn't he? That's right. So then he didn't do it. And then he took him up on the cynical uh, temple, and then he takes him from there up on a mountain. And here's what shocked we people. And he showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Just think of that. In other words, it just opened up, and he saw all the kingdoms of the world. United States, Russia, Great Britain. And all of them, he said, these are mine, Satan did. Jesus knows they were his. He said, and I'll give them to you if you'll fall down and worship me. See? But Jesus knew in the millennium he was going to fall heir to him anyhow. Watch us a few years away, see? Why, he knew he was going to be his anyhow. So he said, it's written not to worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall I serve. So Satan got enough of that when he just kept pouring the word on to him, just pouring the word to him. That's settled. But did you ever think now that these nations are Satan? What about that, Doctor? They're, the Bible says that they're controlled by Satan. That's the reason we have wars. But over in Revelation said, you Rejoice, ye heavens and earth. For the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. Is that right? Now, that's when Jesus knew he was going to take over. And he ruled and reigned a thousand years. Won't have any war then. All the, 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 the swords will be beat into plowshares. Is that right? And in the pruning hook. And we will have no more war. Won't that be wonderful? And all the old people in the resurrection will turn back to young men and women again. Isn't that marvelous? See, when you're old, most of us, we're past that bloom of life. When you're born, God intended that. And if nothing interrupts your life, you'll become to a full statue of man or woman, whatever he intended you to be. If there's not some interruption, Satan does interrupting. And then, when, uh, did you ever think that the color of hair that you got when you was a young woman of about 20, and you're the young man, you realize that that'll be the same color of hair in the resurrection? That's right. The same, if, a, if a yellow grain of corn goes in the ground, 
a blue grain don't come up in his place, does it? Now, see, the whole Christian principle is based on resurrection. The same one goes down, the same one comes up. See? And now when you was about 16 and or 20, you was around about your best, I guess it's about 20, 21, I think the cells reached their best. You remember when the first morning you was combing and you happened to run into a gray something here in the side? <laughs> You went and said, look, mother, yes, yeah, I'm about 25 maybe, and you have to notice, mother, those beautiful dove eyes like it, a wrinkle just begin to come under them. Strange, about 25. After a while, them wrinkles begin to get more and more. That hair begins to get grayer, and then that flesh begins to fatten out. Water comes in. You begin moving back then. Death has set in. It's going to conquer you. That's right. God said for it to. That's the only avenue He can take you out of here. Is that right? Then you're you're living up till that time, and then you're dying. You're going back until the day that He'll finally conquer you, and your cells deteriorate, go back into the dust of the earth. But God don't lose nothing. He knows right wherever He had him in the first place. If you didn't, how did you ever come on you? Nobody didn't paste it on you and make you bigger. You just pushed out and drove and pushed out until it comes to the regular size. Is that right? Then all that death can do for you, it takes you out of this life. And some writer said one time that the only thing death could do to a believer, that God harnessed it to a buggy and it pulls the believer in the presence of his maker. That's a good idea. Is that right? Just pulls him right up to God. And then that, that's all it can do. Then in the resurrection... See, all death can do is take you out of this life, then it's finished. And in the resurrection, then there's, death has no part at all. Then just what you was, when you were your best, what God had you, that's what you'll be in the resurrection. If I had a chance or was going to be here a little longer, I can take God's Bible and prove that's the truth. Exactly, without a, without a shadow of doubt, just exactly what he's done to to back in the Old Testament and the things and prove it by the Word of God that you'll be just like you are when you were young and you'll be young forever. We'll vary in size. Different. Now you say, oh, you, I believe we'll all look just alike. Well, God's not that type of a person. Look at his creation. He's got palm trees down here. He's got oak trees up in my country. He's got pine trees over in the mountains. He's got little mountains, big mountains, little trees, big trees. He's got deserts and, and jungles and deserts and mountains and plains and seas. God's a God of variety. He has white flowers, blue flowers, pink flowers, red flowers. Is that right? He's a God of variety. Look what he made. Look what he made in the first place. Then you see what he is. When we resurrect, we'll be red-headed, black-headed, and blonde, and just exactly like we was here. But in the resurrection of perfection. Say, that ought to make all of us old folks start shouting. No. <laughs> It sure ought to, because that's the truth. That thus saith the Lord. Yes, sir. And it will not fail. So then, if you are anchored in Christ, and by one Spirit we're all baptized into one church, you think you're going to let me get by with that? <laughs> by one Spirit we're all not joined in, but we're baptized into one body body of believers, see, all baptized, not joined in, baptized in. How we be baptized? By one water, no, one lake, no, by one spirit. We're all baptized into one body and become members of that body. Oh, my, that don't make me feel good to think of that. So what can harm you? And then in that body, when we come in, we are sealed, not from one revival to another, but until the day of our redemption. Ephesians 4.30, Greet not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed until your redemption. Now, if you're having this up and down, backside and up and down, in and out, and this, that way, and don't know where you're standing, you haven't sealed yet. See, when a box car out here on the track is passing by here, the first thing you know, they start packing it and putting things in it. Well, they, it has to be inspected before it can be sealed. The inspector comes around, if everything's 
sword shake loose on the track, you make it tear it out and put it over again. That's what we do from one revival to another. <laughs> That's right. Clean her out. Start over again. Let's come on back and start again. But when once you've really got packed in God's Spirit as a right away and you become a child of God, then the door is closed, a seal is put on that door, and that door cannot be opened until its destination. Is that right? The door's destined to be. Or before we are sealed by the Holy Ghost until the day of our redemption. Amen. My. So what, what we got to worry about? Why are you walk along with a long face like you eat oats to the bottom of a churn? Why, my. My, we're happy. We're Christians. And God has ordained us so and has given Christ for us and no man could come to him now. You say, well, bless God, I tell you, I, I got to seeking God. No, you never. You never did seek God. Man never did seek God. There's no such a thing as man seeking God. You know that? God seeks man. That's right. No, you said, is that scriptural? Yes, sir. Jesus said, no man can come to me except my Father draws him first. Your whole nature is altogether against God. And it has to take the Holy Spirit to first put that desire in there for you to linger after God. Is that right? And then when all that comes to me, I'll give him everlasting life. There you are. And then I'll raise him up at the last day. So now whether we live, whether we die, whether the world stands or whether it doesn't, whether the people think this or that, there's only one alternative that we should have. That's worship God and be just as happy as we can be, breathing for everything He said. Because in life or death or nothing can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ, and there we'll be with Him in His presence forever. Say, Brother Bram, that sounds very Calvinistic. Well, I believe in Calvinist doctrine as long as Calvinist stays in the Bible. See? You get out of the Bible, I don't believe it. I believe this. I believe every believer believes it with me. That the church has eternal security. God has promised and said he would be there without a blemish, spot, or wrinkle. Is that right? God's done said so. so that, now, if you're in the church, you're secured with the church. Is that right? I don't mean Methodist or Baptist now, or Pentecostal. That means... Holy Spirit born again, sir. That one we born into. Then you're secured while you're in the church. This building has been built here for security of weather. As long as I'm in here, the weather ain't going to bother me. See? It ain't going to rain on me here because there's a roof over me. You stay in the church, you got the protection of Jesus Christ. Is that right? Now, I'm just speaking just a moment to people kind of got to settle down. And I'm sure wish that I hadn't have made an arrangement or another meeting somewhere. I still believe that Miami and its hold can be turned upside down for God. But what it's going to take is a month, its faithful few, is sitting here this afternoon with such a hunger to do that or see that until you can't sleep or eat. <laughs> When the travel of soul comes up on the person, Zion will bring forth children. That's the cure. But when you get that kind of a place, then you were going to get somewhere. And I trust that this little meeting will never die, that it will live on and on and on. Now there's been seeds planted. Now Paul said, one plants, another waters, God takes the injury. And I pray that God will pour out the water and the Holy Spirit will take the injury. Now, this afternoon I'm supposed to speak or preach or whatever you, uh, as I've said before, I'm not a preacher, but I'm what they call a spare car, see, and uh, then when I just uh, preach around, I, now the reason I say that, I say that because of the respect of, now I'm saying is. Loving my Lord, of course I love him. Sure I do. And I love him just as good as I don't 
If getting an education makes you love the Lord more, brother, I'd start the college right now. Uh, I just don't. But God don't require an education for love. He requires a simple heart just to believe him. That's right. And many times I say this. Now, I'm not trying to use this for crutches to support my ignorance. But education has been the greatest hindrance the gospel of Jesus Christ has ever had. Right. The, the greatest hindrance that the gospel of Jesus Christ has ever had has been education. Right. The theology has, broke, has taken the place of the Holy Spirit. That's true. And now, I remember when I was a little boy, I've always liked horses. And I would come over with the finest little chap here, it's Brother Vale's boy, it's called him Gray, I believe his name is. And if he is a swell little lad, I, I, he said to me, Brother Branham, he said, these palm trees are for the people that live here. <laughs> he was a Canadian. <laughs> he wanted to get back to the snow country. So he liked horses. And I said, I tell you, you won't go wrong as long as you love nature. Because God's in nature. And so we were talking. And I was thinking when I was a little lad, that's what I liked. I like my father was a was a rider, and he was a good rider. He used to go out, and he was a shot. Oh my, what a shot with revolvers! He'd take these great big stone marbles and roll them out like that, and have two guns and shoot one and put it off the marble in there and burst the marble with the other gun before it hit the ground. I couldn't hit a warning stone like that; and it, it laying still. But I I, I like that. Outdoors and a rider, I've seen him ride. To be honest, I, I I'd be scared to death riding bucking horses. But well, when I was just a little lad, he met my mother. My mother is, is from Paris, Texas. My father was from Kentucky, and so my dad was there breaking horses when he in a rodeo when he met mother. And so they were married, and Mama was only 15 years old when I was born. So that she was just a kid. Pop was eighteen. But I used to want to be like my daddy. I just loved my daddy. He didn't wasn't a Christian until a little bit before he died. I led him to Christ. But he was Irish through and through and a real drinker. And no matter what he did, I don't care what he did, he's my daddy anyhow. And listen, young folks. And whenever it gets to a place that you have to call your dear mother and daddy, no matter what they've done, when it comes to a place that they're not mother and daddy, just the old man and old woman, that's when you've taken one of the greatest backsliding states that you've ever touched. You'll never know what that mother means to you and that father until you hear that squeaking of the casket as it's going out the door. You realize it's not the old man, then. You realize them gray hairs in his head? You help put them there. I know my old daddy worked for 75 cents a day until mother would take the scissors and cut his shirt loose in the back where his shirt would sunburn to his back. 75 cents a day to make a living for me when I was too young to know Harley was about four or five years old. Uh, he's my daddy, yes. The snow probably lays over his grave today in Indiana. But he's my daddy anyhow. And I love him. I remember I used to want to be like him. I remember one time when he used to have... A little old farm we worked on. I had an old plow horse. And Dad let me use that one because he's gentle and he's so old. And I'd plow with him, and then we'd go down to where the old water trough was. Had an old log cut out in the water trough. How many ever seen one of them and things? Say, what I wire tie over here this afternoon, folks? Well, we're just country folks, aren't we? Because <laughs> we live in Palm Beach. That hasn't taken the country out of us yet, has it? Yes, sir. An old watering trough for the bees to go down there, you know, and hum around, get the hair out of the mane or the tail of the horse and put it in there and make a horse hair snake. You ever see one of them cells move? <laughs> we used to do that. Now, now when I get in, I come in a little early and water my horse first before Dad. He'd go plumb the dark and had to milk the old cow. Well, my brother did. I couldn't milk and never could. So then I'd come around there and I'd water the horse and I had to do some more chores around the house. And I'd get out there and my brothers would all climb up along on this. Uh, side of the fence, 
and Pop would be back to back to the place still working. I'd get the old horse and look around and see if Mama and none of them was watching, you know. I'd get Dad's saddle and throw it over and get me a handful of cockle birds and pick them up under the saddle like that and pull the girl up real tight and climb up on them. Anybody that ever rode with a cockle bird under the saddle, you know how the poor old horse, or I'm saying to myself the other day, a poor old fellow so tired and old, too stiff to get his feet off the ground, and cockle birds are pinching, you know, he'd just stand there and bawl, you know, like that, jerk his feet up and down like that. He couldn't bust, he was too old. Fifth. He just bawled and go on like that. I'd jerk off his hat and sway from one side to the other. I was a real cowboy. <laughs> yes, sir. My brothers all sat there and clapped their hands, you know. <laughs> Always. I was a real rider. I was no more than sitting in the chair there and somebody rocking me, you see. So when I got to be about 18 years old, I, I was sure they needed me off a bat out west to break their horses. <laughs> I knew they just couldn't hardly get along without me, so I slipped off from home, went out west. I landed in Arizona just about time of rodeo time. Got me a pair of Levi's, went out there, and I thought, now I'm going to go home in the silver saddle, and I'm sure going to make a lot of money. So I climbed up on the side of the crowd, you know, and they went forth, and they turned the horse loose there. They were going to have a rider to ride this horse. And brother, the had is... When he come out of the chute, put him in the bull pen when he come out, I, that horse made about two bucks and a sun feast and the saddle went one way, a rider went the other, the pickups got the horse, the hammers got the rider. Blood poured out of his ears and nose laying out there all crumbled up on the, the ground. I thought, uh-oh, that don't look like that old flat horse I rode. I don't know whether I'm going to have a silver saddle or not. So then, caller went by and he said, I'll give any man here a hundred dollars that'll ride this horse two minutes. And he went right down along, all that bunch of cowboys lined up along the trail fence, all disfigured, you know, real cattlemen. Here I was sitting there, my feet spread out trying to look like a cowboy. That hat on, my ears pulled down. And that fellow walked right straight up to me, looked in my face and said, are you a rider? I said, no, sir. I done changed my mind right quick. But I wasn't a rider. That wasn't my old plow horse, and I know what I couldn't say on that thing. That's the reason I say today I'm not a preacher, see. When I was first ordained to Baptist church, I had local charter license, I had my Bible on my arm. Every time I'd meet anybody, say, Say, are you a preacher? Sure. Yes, sir. One day I was over in St. Louis, Missouri, and his fellow named Robert Doherty a Pentecostal preacher. And that man, I heard him in a tent meeting, and I was supposed to help him this meeting, and that man preached till he got the red in the face, he lose his breath and go plumb to his knees, buckle. I don't see, and he catch his breath and you hear him about three blocks away and come back up and he's still preaching. <laughs> Somebody said, are you a preacher? I said, no, sir. <laughs> My old slow Baptist ways don't think of it that fast. <laughs> so, that's the reason I'm kind of careful about saying I'm a preacher, you see. Especially when Dr. Vale and many of these men are sitting around who are real preachers. But whenever I, whenever I do this, I like to talk about the Lord. We all do that, don't we? So now, let's read some of these words. Ask him to help us. I want you now, I believe the crowd's about to settle down and gathered in. And I won't speak to you it's too long, I trust. And I... Want to read some scripture where I know that his word will never fail. And I'm a great believer in the word. Are you? And for this is thus saith the Lord. I believe it. Hang the soul on any phase of it there. Hey, it's right. Now, now, you could have left that alone just for a minute longer. <laughs> All right. All right. And the 11th chapter of St. John. Uh, I want to read, oh, I didn't mean that so sincerely, but thank you anyhow. In the 11th chapter of St. John, beginning at the 18th verse, I want to read a few scriptures here. I want to speak on the resurrection. Say, what a text to take amongst a bunch of people that, well, maybe we need a resurrection. <laughs> Don't you think so? Old minister, one time he went and preached repentance. 
one night. Next night he come back and preached repentance. He preached the full week. He started the second week on repentance. Some of the elders met him at the door and said, Can't you preach nothing else but repentance? He said, Oh, yes, let them all repent and I'll change. So I had time. As soon as everybody repented, well, then it was all right to start something else. So that's a good idea. Now, the 11th chapter and the 18th verse. Now, Bethany was nigh to Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs to all. And many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brethren. But Martha, as soon as she heard Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou would have been here, my brother would not die. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask God, God will give it to thee. I like that, don't you? Jesus said unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth, whatever die, believeth thou this? She said unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. Now, let's lay aside our tears just a moment now, next few minutes, and let's speak to him. That's our head first. Father, we thank thee today for a happy, joyful heart that's made possible only by Jesus Christ. How can we be anything else but happy and know what we know? We're so grateful to you to be mindful of us and to bring us into this great fellowship and also relationship with thee. Fellowship to Christ, relationship to God by the Son of God. We thank you. And now we pray that all of our tears of this life may be brushed aside right now. What we're going to do tomorrow or the next day matters not. It may not even come. But now we're going to speak on your word. And I pray God is not knowing what to say, that you will circumcise the lips of your servant and will circumcise the heart of the hearer. And may the Holy Spirit take these things which are of God and place them into the heart of the believer and of the unbeliever. And may he so water it with the blessings of power until it will bring forth fruit for the Master. Hear us, Lord. And may there not be any people sick left in this building this afternoon. May there not be one sinner left in the building. May the sinners be saved and the sick healed. And may the saints be full of power and glory, magnifying Jesus Christ, the Son of God, to whom we ask in his name for these blessings. Amen. <laughs> Now, for, we want to take our thoughts on the great principle of Jesus' ministry and what he was. And now, in our text, where we're at at this time, we're just at the beginning of the budding of his ministry. Now, if you'll notice, the first year of his ministry, he was... Oh, he was all of it. In the second year of his ministry, they beginning to find fault. Just a little later, they crucified him. That's the way of the revival. It'll go up and blossom, and then as soon as the pencil gets knocked off, it begins to settle down. And Jesus, in this time speaking, was just in the beginning of his ministry. And how that the people were coming from everywhere to see him. And he was staying with a, some friends, Martha, Mary, which was two sisters, and their brother's name was Lazarus. 
And I have read that were Martha and Mary for their uh, daily bread, they made little tapestries and things for the temple, needlework. And Lazarus was trained to be a scribe that would write the letters of the law had taken a, a real consecrated man to do that. He wouldn't receive nothing else but a writer, a scribe. And Jesus had, had left and come up uh, to Bethany to, to live with them. And his ministry was in his best right there in Bethany. And now, let's take back a little piece to find out about the ministry of Jesus. God always declares and warns people before he does anything. Do you believe that? And I say this with holy reverence, that I believe that the signs and wonders that you're seeing taking place today, Christian friends, is a perfect vindication of soon coming judgment. Amen. Judgment has got to strike the world. For if people won't receive mercy, there's nothing left but judgment. Mercy always foreruns judgment. Did in the antediluvian destruction, it did through John the Baptist, and so is it now. Forerunning of mercy. And if you spurn mercy, there's only one thing left is judgment. Like you say, will God stand and judge me at the day of judgment? No, no. Your attitude towards me now, you're judging yourself. God has already pronounced, the day you eat thereof, that day you die, that just settles it. That's the ass of save of that. You don't have to pronounce any more judgment. Your attitude towards it is uh, the recompense. What you think of his way of escape, if you refuse to walk in his way, then you're already judging uh, yourself as you judge him. Now, before God sends a message to the earth, God sends angels sometimes as message, messengers to the earth to bring his message. Do you believe in that? God has angels. Now, some time ago, someone called my hand on that and said, Brother Branham, a great fundamental brother, he said, there's only one flaw that I can find with your message to the people. And I said, what's that, my brother? If it's not scriptural, then I'll get rid of it and repent. He said, well, you're always referring to an angel. And said, the angel of God met you and told you so and so. He said, Brother Branham, don't you know that God doesn't use angels to direct his church? That the Holy Spirit directs this church. I said, that is true. But God also has angels, ministering spirits sent from God. And he said, oh, Brother Bram, that was Old Testament doctrine. That you mix the New Testament with the Old. I said, one's just a shadow of the other. And I said, you've got to have the Old Testament. It's just a shadow of the New. And the Old Testament and both of them together confirm God's uh, attitude towards the people. And Paul said in Hebrews, the 12th chapter, seeing that we are compassed about with such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every sin, or every weight in the sin that does so easily to set it. Now, he said, well, now Daniel had angel and so forth, but said the New Testament does not support uh, angelic beings coming to individuals as the Holy Spirit has come. And I said, oh, brother, I'm different with you. I said, I believe that the Holy Spirit is here. He's the one that fills us. And our life is not our own, but it's the life of the Holy Spirit in us that makes us Christians. I believe that. That every fiber of a Christian's body is controlled by the Holy Spirit. I believe that your eyes are. You can't help from look to see an evil, but if you lust after it, you've already committed adultery. You turn your head. The Holy Spirit makes you do that. Is that right? You might be tempted. Temptation is not sin. Eating your temptation is sin. See? You can be tempted. Christ is tempted like we are, but never sin. So the Holy Spirit is God that helps us bear out the truth of God. And we are written epistles, read of all men. Now, he said, now what about the, the angels in the New Testament? I said, well, I look at uh, Mary, the virgin. She was visited by an angel. He said, oh, but that was before the Holy Spirit came. 
I said, Ben, I'd like to ask you this. Do you believe that Philip had the baptism of the Holy Spirit? All of us do that, don't we? Why, when Philip was down in Samaria with a great revival going on, it wasn't the Holy Spirit who came and called him out to the desert of Gaza. It was the angel of the Lord. Is that right? The angel of the Lord. Well, we all believe that Peter had the Holy Ghost on him. He was a chief spokesman at Pentecost at the inauguration of the church. And we know he had the Holy Ghost. But when he was in prison, and they were going to cut his head off the next day, and they were having a prayer meeting down at John Mark's house, who was it went up there to the prison and loosed him? The Holy Spirit? The angel of the Lord. And it was in the form of a light. Is that right? Came in the window. Raised him up. Loosed the shackles. Passed him to the guards. Opened the gates. And Peter thought he was dreaming all the time. Until he got outside. Oh, I'll tell you, if he packed away under the power of God, means something. You lose your own senses and everything when you're carried away by the power of God. Now, that was the angel of the Lord. The great Saint Paul truly had the Holy Ghost. And he taught the Holy Spirit. And he said in Galatians 1, 8, If an angel from heaven would teach any other thing, let him be a curse. And when Paul was out on the sea and uh, 14 days and nights with no lunar stars, he went out in the gallery to pray, and he come up shaking his hands, I can see him screaming and saying, Be in a good chair. Oh, my, what happened to that little fellow? Why, well, he said, The angel of God, whose servant I am, stood by me last night, saying, Don't fear, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar, and, Lo, God, give all them a sail with his to you. He said, Wherefore, sirs, be of a good courage, for I believe God that will be just the way it was shown to me. The angel of God, whose servant I am. Now, that is an angel of God. The whole book of Revelation is wrote by an angel. And God does have an angel. Now, and before God sent Jesus to the earth, he sent an angel. And an angel come to a home. Zachariah and Elizabeth, they were great, renowned believers, Christians as to call. And that's the kind of a home that an angel can get to. You know what I think today the reason we don't have any more angelic visitations than we do? We who call ourselves Christians, play cards half the night, read old through story magazines, have here in our spots, and that's the reason angels don't visit us. You can't mix oil and water. Now, brother, I'm just an old-fashioned, fast-breath, backwood, Holy Ghost, second-born preacher, and I believe in the old-fashioned cornbread and sauerkraut potatoes and beans that ain't ice cream, but it'll stick to your ribs and carry you through the, the time. Now, I believe in old-time Holy Ghost salvation. Cleanse the man's heart up, and that's all I know to say about. So now I just put on and let's, let's ask God to pour it out upon us. Now, what do you say? Let him stand it in the form of the old fashioned raining down of power of God. Now, these angels come into these homes when they were renowned homes. And he went one day, Zachariah, down to the priest, uh, making a sacrifice, and his order was to burn incense. And while he was burning the incense, the angel of God came, Gabriel, to his right hand side and spoke to him and said, said uh, Zachariah told him that when he went home after the days of the ministration of the temple, that he was going to, to be with his wife and she was going to bear a child and she was an old woman. See how God always he takes the very ridiculous to do what he's going to do. Who would ever think that he'd take a hillbilly or something like that that hardly knows your ABCs or something to make a minister? When he got Peter, James, and John, the Bible said that they were ignorant and unlearned man. He didn't look for any scholars. He went out and he got an old speechman down there with an old greasy feet tape around him, hardly didn't know his ABCs, and made a saint of God out of him and gave him the keys to the kingdom. Amen. Amen. All right. That's the way God does. And he came down to the very ridiculous. Someone said, not long ago, now, God bless you, my dear Catholic friends here, see. Said, Brother Brandon, if that gift had been given, the Pope of Rome would have known about it. He knows just about as much as Catholics as know that that was the Christ that was born. 
God doesn't deal in great dignity reigns like that. He comes to the poor and humble and takes that which he is not to bring to pass that. But when foolishness of preaching, you condemn the mighty and wise. God does that. He always takes the very Lord to bring it up. If them apostles could have said, we're educated, we're smart, we got all kinds of degrees, that had something to glory in, but they were ignorant and unlearned men, and God taken that which was not and made that which is. Hallelujah. Oh, I love that. When I think that everybody's got a chance. You say, now, wait a minute, preacher. Paul was an educated man. That's exactly right. You said he had to forget everything he knew to learn Christ, too, and die daily over it. Yes, sir. Now, that is truth, and that's where our world is, our churches are failing today. We're trying to get into our pulpit. You people who are electing your pastors, you're trying to get the very smartest, newest, freshest thing out of the seminary that you can find, and sometimes that's the worst thing you can have. Right. What, what we need today is a man with an experience of God who will... Lay it out to the root of the tree and let the chip fall right away and preach the unadulterated gospel of the church turns him out. Fellow said to me, I'm going to say, Preacher, if I preach that, he said, I'll be preaching the four walls. I said, I'm going to be preaching that concrete drops the truth of God. <laughs> That's right. And have favor with God if I had to eat soda crackers and drink French water and be pre preaching the truth and have fried chicken three times a day and have a collar turned around and standing for something I never go out. Amen. Amen. That's free. That's right. God's spirit. What we need today is a good old-fashioned St. Paul's revival and the Bible Holy Ghost back in the church again as a light of God. This priest standing out making his sacrifices or while this offering prayer waiting and a righteous man, godly man, and over to his right side appeared this great Gabriel, the archangel, God always sends minor angel, but Gabriel announced the first coming of Christ and Gabriel will announce the second coming of Christ. Right, the archangel of God will announce the second coming of Christ. Now, I want you to notice Beautifully here, and the angel told him when he went home, he would be with his wife and she'd bear a child. I noticed that scholarly man, who had plenty of examples to look to, he said, how can these things be? My wife is old, oh, maybe 10, 15 years past the menopause. But look where Sarah was. She was 40 years past the menopause. Look at Hannah. He had plenty of examples that he ought to have been able to read in the scripture and know that that was the truth. But many times he read it, but he didn't apply it as the same God then being the same God then. And that's what's the matter today. We think of days of miracles are past. We're failing to see that the same God the world is now and always will be. How easy the Jews condemn Jesus when they see why they walk to the Red Sea their father's head and on dry land and all these miracles and signs and then still didn't believe that that was their God. They're doing the same thing. That's what it is today. It's the failing of the church when we theology and stuff and education has took the place of the old fashioned mourners then. We used to have the mourners then. You took that down in the basement. We don't use it no more. That's the truth. And we, all the fire we ever had on the altar, we put it in the stove. What we need today, you say, well, Brother Phantom, I'm afraid you'll get a little fanaticism, a little wildfire. I'd rather have a little wildfire no fire at all. No. I can put up with a little fanaticism before I can put up with something so icy and stiff and starch and ungodly. How can God move into a place like that? Go into a place of spiritual thermometer rest is 100 below zero. <laughs> Somebody say amen, everybody set your neck, look around, see who said it. Preacher said to interrupt me, a little old woman one time lived up in Kentucky. Her boy come out there to Indiana and joined a nice big church. It wasn't the church that I brought, it was the Methodist church, I was a Baptist. And he went out to the Methodist church and they began as the great Darcy church. She come out with a little fired up Methodist church. She went out that morning where her son and him was going to the church at, and she walked in while the, the man at the door didn't even want to let her in. She had a little 
calico dress or gingham or whatever you call it, up around her neck like this, and little old lace up shoes, and long sleeves like that, and come walking, tipping like a little man, you know, ought to, walking in the church, and the doorman looks back at her like that, and to say, what are you? And it embarrasses her boy. Uh, Brother, if you've got a mammy like that, you ought to thank God for somebody. What we need today is some more old-fashioned mothers like that. She was so happy to get to church, and she got up sitting in the church, the preacher said something about the blood of Jesus Christ. She said, Amen! And everybody stretched her neck like a crane to look around and see who it was. And the preacher lost his face. He said, mm, 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 mm. He didn't know what had happened. Well, then, she sat there, just, he didn't know she was out of place. She sat there, look. Listen, brother, she might not have had her name in Who's Who, as this great book of Who's Who they got, but I, she had her name on the Lamb's Book of Life, and I'd rather have my name there than all the Who's Who's in this world. That's Who's, in my opinion, who, who, who is. God's Who's Who. I'm glad my name is. You know that thing that's supposed to get out of Who's Who, the 400 millionaires and so forth, all the dignitaries of the world. Let this world have it. Our name's written in heaven on the Lamb's Book of Life, and that's who God's Who's Who might be silly to the world, but your name's on the Lamb's Book of Life. He was sitting there with her arms folded, just as bright as she could be, and the preacher said something else. Uh, after a while, she thought it was a preacher said, Amen! And everybody, and you know what? The ushers come and put her out of the church is interrupting the pastor and couldn't preach his sermon, talking about falling from grace. Oh my, that just goes to show the difference. Yes, now, Sarah, a little woman, way in the room, and she had the baby. Now, why couldn't Hannah have, and Hannah did the same? Now, how about Elizabeth? But John said, or not John, excuse me, Zachariah said, oh, she couldn't do it. She's too old. Look, here's the sovereignty of God. The angel said, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God, and my word shall be fulfilled in her season. And because you doubted my word, you'll be dumb till the day the baby's born. Hallelujah. If God says anything, commissions it and sends it to the earth. Oh, hell might explode, but it will never change God's word. It'll be anyhow. God's done spoke it. That makes it right. Oh, that settles it to me. When God says so, I believe it, don't you? That's it. All right. We notice then, well then... He was dumb. He went out to the people at Beck and they thought he'd seen a vision. He went home to live with his little wife, and surely she conceived, and she hid herself for six months. Six months later, this same angel came down into Nazareth, a wicked little old city where a young lady was having a maybe a blue Monday war chase. She's walking down, she's engaged to a man, a widower of four children. Had the pot of water on her head, walking down through the street, and all at once the great light flashed before her, like a great light standing there. And in the middle of this light stood the great archangel Gabriel. And he said, Hail Mary! In other words, stop! It's like your little virgin. He was like you. Thank of such a salutation as that. Hail Mary! Blessed art thou among the women. For thou hast found favor with God. Oh, my. Thou hast found favor with God. Told her what was going to happen. That she was going to bear, bring the child, knowing no man. And she said, how will it be? He said, the Holy Ghost is going to overshadow you. Gabriel speaking. The Holy Ghost is going to overshadow you. And you're going to conceive. And in your womb is going to come forth a blood cell, and it's going to develop into be the Son of God. And you'll call his name Jesus. And now look at the difference between Mary, that young woman, and this old callous preacher. Just look at the difference. The preacher said he had plenty of examples back there for women who actually to bring children in the natural way, had plenty of examples of those that had passed at age. But this little girl had to believe something that never had happened before. She had to believe for a virgin birth. And she didn't question. She didn't say, wait, let me see what this says or what that says. She just took God at his word. She said, behold, the hands made of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. 
and the angel left her. And to tell her about Elizabeth and so forth. Now, here's what I like about Mary. She didn't wait till she felt right for this. She didn't wait till anything stopped. She didn't wait till any natural, visible sign of it at all. She just took God at his word and began to testify and glorify God that she's going to have a baby before she had any visible results from what the angel told her. She believed that it was the word of God. And God would do it because God had spoken. And she took God at his word. And if we could ever get to a place where men and women this day would be that simple, that would just take God at his word, don't wait to see whether I can move this foot or not, or this arm or not, or where this cancer looks like it's gone, or this heart troubles any better. Take God at his word, get a happy middle attitude towards it, and start rejoicing, saying, God, you said so, and it's got to come to pass. Yes, sir. He didn't wait till she was positive. No, sir. And then she'd heard about something else. She'd heard it. Her cousin was going to have a, a baby. Oh, so right up into Judea she went to help her rejoice. Many people get saved and they say they do. And this text say, I don't even tell nobody about it. <laughs> Why, you haven't got saved, right? You might have uh, some kind of a little mental upset up here. But brother, when you really get saved in the old-fashioned way, brother, if God comes into your heart and makes you a new creature, you can't sit still. You just can't do it. The whole world's got to know it. You've got to tell them about it. Could you imagine Philip down there, Stephen, a man full of the Holy Ghost, the Bible said. How could you stop him? Why, it's like a house on fire and a dry weather and a windy day. Well, you couldn't put him out if you had to. The only way they could stop him was kill him. He was full of the Holy Ghost. He was no preacher. He wasn't. He was just a deacon, but he was out on the street testifying and glorifying God. We well, couldn't stop him. The Holy Ghost had him so wrapped up so he, he was, was his own. He only looked through God's eyes. He only seen what God seen. He only acted on what God said. Oh, God, if we could ever have a revival like that, you would see the whole thing broke down and America would have a real coming back to God when we can get to a people who won't think their own thoughts, won't think their theology, but we'll just take what God said and live for that. You believe that's what we need today? Away she goes, up in the hills of Judea, to testify, to talk about it. I can see Elizabeth. When she looks down and sees her coming, she's lovely. She loved her cousin. So she wrote, runs out to meet her. Now, Elizabeth had, had hid herself for six months. So when she sees this girl coming, she ran out. She was so happy. She put her arms around her, hugged her, and called her her name, and began to rejoice. And she said, I'm so happy to know that you're going to be a mother. She said, yes. She said, well, I'm, I'm very happy, but I'm just a little scared. Because it's six months to be his mother, no life yet. All subnormal. See how God does? Always a ridiculous. All subnormal. The little baby John was six months with no life. And then she said, and Mary said, Well, I've got something good to tell you. The Holy Ghost appeared to me also and told me that I was going to have a child, unknowing no man. And I call his name Jesus. And just as soon as that lame Jesus, come to human lips for the first time, little John received the baptism of the Holy Ghost and began to leap in in his mother's room for joy. That's right. And if the, birth, if the name of Jesus Christ spoke by a human being to make a dead baby come to life, what ought to do to a church that's born again of the Spirit of God? It ought to bind every devil, heal every sick person. Amen. That's right. What are to do to people who claim to be born again? Little John, in his mother's womb, six months of developing a cell and no life. The Bible said that John the Baptist was born from his mother's womb full of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Oh, I like that. Born from his mother's womb full of the Holy Ghost. And he began to leap and jump for joy. You know, when the Holy Ghost comes on you, something's got to turn loose. And if a baby's born, and that baby, somebody says, well, I'm born again. You sound like it. All right. Now, if a baby is born, and that baby's born still birth, you know what's the matter with that baby? 
the baby's born dead. And that's what's the matter with a whole lot of stillborn children in these formal churches today. You're born dead. You've got a conception but never received life. What to do with a baby like that? Pick him up by the heel and give him a little bit of posterior protoplasma stimulation. I'll tell you, he comes to life right quick. And if there's anything the church needs today is a good old-fashioned gospel, holy ghost pagan, by the hand of God pouring out his power, it'll make the church come to life. Amen. That may seem flat, but it's the truth. Yes, sir. You spank him a little bit and you let out a squall. Crying. Oh, my. I can see Martha or Mary when she's up there and Elizabeth went out there to reach and grab her and hug her. What a marvelous time. You know, today we kind of lost that kind of feeling for one another. Isn't that right? I never forget Miami. That woman said, I don't mean to hurt your feelings. If some lady let us have a great big place out here, she's supposed to be, what is them, justice? Justice is some kind of a woman like that. And I was having a meeting. And they had her out in a little place. They said, Brother Huckster said, Brother Branham, the, the, the Duchess wants to see. I said, the who? He said, the Duchess. I said, who's she? He said, well, she's the greatest woman around here. I said, oh, is she born again? I said, well, I don't know. And I said, well, what's she anymore? These other people out here. I said, well, you speak to her as you go through the back of the hall. I said, all right. When I got back there, there stood a great big woman with about enough clothes on it she could put an aspirin box. And that woman, yeah, and enough jewelry on her. I ain't making fun. I'm taking back because I'm in the full business. They would have fed four children and paid my missionary trip twice to Africa. <laughs> And she had a pair of specs in her hand on a stick, holding them out like that. Now, you know that woman couldn't see through them glasses out that far. Holding out like that, she had her hands so full of joy, and she said, Sir, I am so calm to me. Held her hand up like this. I reached out over a big fat hand and I said, Get it down here so I know you want to see me again. What we need today, brother, is people putting on too much dog, we call it the city expression. What are you anyhow but six foot of dirt? God have mercy on you, I don't care how you can dress, how you can act, what kind of a home you can live in, what kind of a car you can drive, if you're not born of the power and spirit of the resurrected Jesus Christ, you're lost and will go to hell. This is sure the Lord will go to his body. Amen. That's the truth. Oh, my. There was some time ago, my wife and I were going downtown, this a young lady on the street, she said, People are just getting away from love. And that's the main thing you've got to have. Going down the street, and I drive my wife. Some lady said, Hello, brother, Sister Branham. I said, How do you do? And I said, uh, Do it like that. Bow my head to her. I said, How do you do? Riding on down the street. And I said, Do you speak to her? She said, Yes. I said, I must be getting hard of hearing. I said, I never heard you. She said, Oh, I, I smiled. Now, I said, A little silly dream to take a place of a. Look at me. I don't like that. This is a good old fashioned Holy Ghost Saint revival. Man, back to believe in the Word of God that God will take care of us like He did in the old days. He'll take care of us today. You believe that? God will take care of us. What we need today is another refilling, another, like the disciples, three days. Some of you trying to test and experience or trust it that you had ten years ago. That's all right, but what about today? You need one today. Today is the day. Sure. A feeling. The disciples, about three or four days after he received the Holy Ghost, went back and got in one accord and began to pray again with one accord until the Holy Ghost shut the building where they were sitting. Amen. What we need. Oh, my. You get away from all this, your dignity. I can prove to you that dignity, the devil is the pappy of every bit of it. In the beginning, he wanted something more, more glamorous and everything than what Michael had. He went over and set him up a kingdom, and that's what polluted heavens if it stayed there, and God kicked him out. He's been dignifying the church ever since. The truth, God doesn't dwell in dignity, he dwells in simple, sincere hearts. Hallelujah! Brothers, 
I can notice here not long ago I happened to be preaching at a little old Baptist church as a pastor at Still Pastor, Milltown Baptist Church. I used to go home at night. I looked as a, as a nightingale used to sit there in a the little old cedar bush. I stayed with some people out there about 20 miles out. I'd drive out every night just to be alone and get up in the woods and sometimes pray happy. Did you ever get up in the morning and hear all the robins are hollering? All the little birds, just as soon as it breaks day, we crowd around all night, can't get up till about one o'clock on Sunday, even go to church. Sit around there, take their little head up through the air and sing, sing, sing. You never hear one of them having high blood pressure. You never see one on a crutch, did you? God takes care of them. That's right. They just trust, they will commit everything to God and go ahead. Now, I studied Nightingale. Now, I noticed some nights when the storm clouds was coming over, it quietened down. Now, all at once, he'd let loose again and just sing to the top of his voice. I thought, what, what does that? Now, science tells us or the, uh, that they look up to the heavens. And if they can't see any stars or any light, they get sad so they don't sing. But if he can get his eye on one star, he knows the suns are shining somewhere, so he knows it'll break day after a while, so he just sings to the top of his voice. I thought, oh, God. That's right. If I can get amongst the people who's got you squeak a little amen out once in a while, I must me know that the power of the Holy Ghost still exists somewhere. That's right. If I should go out today, and I'd go out tonight and look up and see that great big bright star, I'd say, star, what makes you shine like that? You're so pretty, what makes you shine and give light down here on the earth? If he could speak, he wouldn't say, he'd say, Brother Branham, it's not me shining, it's the sun shining on me. That's what makes me shine. And that's what makes people, a doctor said to me not, some time ago, said that these people had shouted and praised God and tried to act like they were so happy that they was excited. Well, brother, we better get excited, don't you think so? Excited. And said, I know it isn't, it isn't that, it's not them, it's because the Spirit of God is shining on them. Some time ago I was drinking from an old fountain where I used to go by and drink all the time and there was always a bubble, 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 bubble constantly. And I thought, what makes you so happy at bubbling like that? I thought, maybe because deers drink. No. Because the, uh, the bears drink. No. Maybe because I drink. No. If he could speak and say, Brother Branham, it's not me a bubbling. It's something behind me pushing me and making me bubble. And that is to every believer that's born to the Spirit of God, there's something behind him pushing him, bubbling up. I only have pounds of water bubbling up under everlasting life. That's what the church needs today is a good old-fashioned fresh bubbling up. Yes, sir. Used to be when I was a little kid, I used to think of bubbling. Mama used to, I used to have to cut rails and things to stick under the old kettle and wash out in the backyard, in the wood yard. I don't guess you ever did that. Big old three-legged kettle out in the wood yard, you know, Mama put her clothes there with homemade soap, and I'd have to go out and cut wood and fire under there. Oh, my! I thought, what? So much of that fire? Why does that thing burn so much wood? She said, it's got to get hot or you can do business. That's the way it is with the church. It's got to really get hot or you can't do business. You got to get something. She'd take another old kettle she had there in, in canning time, and she can these little yellow tomatoes to make preserves out of them. Put them between hot biscuits on a cold morning, it'd go good right now. And so she'd put it in there, and I know she'd pour sugar in, and I'd cut wood and pile around that thing, and I was so hot, the steam would be coming up out of it. I said, Mama, ain't that hot enough? She said, No, cut some more wood. I said, Well, Mama, look at the steam. She said, It has to go to bubbling, popping. And when it gets real, real hot, it goes pop, 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 like that, preserves when it's cooking. She said, that's what mixes the sugar and makes it sweet. It says, it ain't fit the can until you get it to popping. I thought, that's right, with an old-fashioned meeting, the thing we got to do is pour on the gospel wood until she gets hot enough to a testimony, pop, 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 bubble, 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 turn over like that. She's getting fit the can and seal into the kingdom of God. Amen! You think I'm crazy, don't you? Well, if I am, I'm happy. Just let me alone. See, I'm, I'm doing fine. I, I, I feel better this way than I did the other way. See? Now, I'm not excited. I know right where I am. See? Now, oh, a good old-fashioned meeting. Here's some time ago, I was up at Gary, Indiana. I was holding a meeting up close there. And they take me over to that big steel mill. And the man was walking me around. He said, uh, preacher? I want to show him this place. I said, all right. 
They had a bunch of benches like those seats there. And every man was working at a lay or so forth. And after a while, a little whistle blows. And when the little whistle blows, why, why all the people uh, begin to take off their aprons and that's a five-minute whistle. And they swept all the shavings out into the middle of the floor. And, and the first thing you know, then another whistle blows. Everybody went out. He stood there and we watched them all go out. He talked. I said, how many men you work and so forth? He said, I'll show you, Reverend Branham, how we clean that up. I said, all right, sir. He walked over there and he pressed the button. I heard something way back on I said, what is that? He said, just watch and see. And the first thing you know, here come a great big magnet passing over. Dropped down like this from way up high. Come down a chute, picked up feet coming down. It went right down along that floor, and all them shavings, practically all of them, jumped right up against that magnet, went right on out, and went over there, and it demagnetized the thing, and every bit of it dropped back into a great big pupil over there to be molded again. <laughs> I said, praise the Lord! He said, what's the matter with you? And I said, uh, or, or nothing? I said, I was just thinking. He said, you must have been. And I said, I want to ask you something. I said, why didn't all them shavings go up? And he said, uh, well, you see, Reverend Bram said, some of them, that magnet won't take. Said it can't go to the magnet because it's not magnetized to it. They're aluminum. Them aluminum shavings won't pick up to that magnet. I said, hallelujah. He said, what's the matter with you? I said, what's the matter? There's some iron laying there. What did it go up? Said Reverend Bram, it's bolted down. I said, glory to God. He said, what's the matter with you? I said, I'm thinking, away oh, back down in the heavens is a big magnet called the Son of God. There's people being magnetized down here. Oh, you might be a shaver or a church member, but grass! Unless you're magnetized to the power of the resurrection and conformed to his power by the Son of God, one of these days God will press the button and some of these shackled down people with worldly lust and pleasures will be left there and the cold formal church members will lay there. But them will be born again, them that are in Christ will God bring with him in the resurrection. Going out into the big molding pot, these old frail bodies will be molded and made into his own glorious likeness. Why wouldn't it make a man shout? Why well, tear you to pieces? Right. I thought of how glorious, how the people got away from God. I noticed these back to their text. Are these two girls standing there, women talking? And so she stayed a few days, and what kind of a man was this man to be? John the Baptist. When he was born, you know, he never went out to some cemetery, or uh, seminary, and, um, excuse me, and he never went out there, but God took him over in the wilderness. What a seminary. The best God's ever had yet. Over in the seminary, so he wouldn't get any theology. But he get neology, <laughs> where God could deal with him out there. And there that fellow stayed in there from about the time he was eight years old until he was thirty. And in those days come John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who has spoken of the prophet Isaiah, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. There he was. Brother, he didn't have on his tuxedo clothes, he didn't have on his collar turned around. But he had an old sheepskin draped around him, but he preached repentance, and he preached Christ, though his simplicity had stirred all the regions around about. What we Baptist churches and all the rest that he need today is another John the Baptist. He preached repentance. He preached Jesus Christ, though his simplicity had drawn all the regions in. The power of God has been the greatest drawing card the world has ever had. There he come preaching. How marvelous, how wonderful. What a real... What a real man of God and a manifestation he was. And he preached, then Christ came on the scene. Then he said, I must decrease, me must increase. John, I like that. He didn't claim to be nothing. He said, I, I, I'm not him. But Jesus said, yes, he is. <laughs> he said, there never was a man born of a woman as great as that man there. That's right. So how be it the least the kingdom of heaven is greater than John. But there's never been a man born of a woman as great as he. Why all the other prophets spoke of him. But John introduced him to the world. This is, behold, the Lamb of God. He introduced him to the world. He's the greatest among the prophets. But John, and notice, I want you to get this now. As he went on, now Jesus' ministry began to come great. And he went away from home, Lazarus' home. And when he left, sorrow came in. 
And let me say this to you, Christian. When Jesus leaves your home, watch out, sorrow's on its road. Sorrow's on its road when Jesus leaves your home. You watch for trouble just as sure as he goes away. If you drive him away with your sinful living, your reckless, careless life, sorrow's on its road to your house. Isn't that right? Now, notice, but in this case, he wasn't run away. He went away because God gave him a vision and told him to go away and wait three days. He said he didn't do nothing unless the Lord showed him in vision. What I see the Father doing, that's what I do. I do nothing else besides that. So he knew he went three days, and first thing you know, they sent, Lazarus got sick. So they sent for Jesus to come, to heal him. And he just ignored it and went on. Brother, I'm telling you, if you'd ever send for your pastor to come pray for you when you're sick and he didn't come, you'd sure leave the Baptist or Methodist church and go over and join the Presbyterians. Or are you Pentecostal to go to the Baptist or somewhere? Yes, sir. No, you couldn't stand that. So they sent for him again. He just ignored it and went on. For he knew that God's will had to be done. All things work together for good to them that love God. Isn't that right? Keep your heart right with God and everything else come all right. Now, he went on just a little farther. And the first thing you know, Lazarus was taken sick. He got sicker, sicker. The doctors come. They could do nothing with him. We're taught mythical, perhaps. I wouldn't say it would be correctly historical. He died with hemorrhages in his lungs. All right. When he died, anyhow, they take him out, bury him. They embalmed his body, put him in the grave, order then a burying like there's a lot in the Orient today. They dig a hole and just lay a rock over the top of it where they bury their dead. So they put him in the grave and he went on. First day passed, my house stabbed that little home. Then the second day passed, worse. Third day, even the fourth day. All hopes are gone. Think about that poor little sad family. Death had struck the home as the saddest hour they'd ever seen. Death was in the home. The man had been down there preaching and healing the sick had turned him down when their brother was dead, uh, dying. And they had faith in the man. They believed that he was a man of God. They'd give up their church because any man that believed on Jesus had to get out of the synagogue. He was a holy roller, see. And so they, they had to get out of the synagogue. As soon as they believed that, there they put him right out. And yet they knew in their hearts that he was God's son. But their theology had tied them up so they couldn't accept that they had their own creeds and their own apostles' creed. Did you ever hear such nonsense? We got today the apostles' creed. I challenge that to the Bible. There is no such a thing as Apostles' Creed. If there's any Apostles' Creed in the Bible, it's found in Acts, where he said, Repent, every one of you, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises to you and your children's children, to them that far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. That sounds more like an Apostles' Creed. Now, I believe in a Holy Roman Catholic Church. I believe in the communion of saints. Anybody who believes in communion of saints is a spiritualist. That's exactly right. Saints are dead during the presence of God. There's no mediator between God and man but Jesus Christ. Amen. That's right. So oh, how you get yourself all twisted up. <laughs> My, it's a shame. Yeah, I don't want to blame you people. It's the pool pit where it started. No wonder that's the damnation of the country when Satan got in the pool pit. Yeah. The truth. Failing to preach the unadulterated word of God. And the word of God will produce just exactly what it said it would do. But we explain it all the way. It's all the way. It's from some other day. Could you imagine somebody standing on a platform saying the baptism of the Holy Ghost, divine healing, and that's for another day? It's like trying to introduce a man freezing to death and paint some fire for him. Say, there's a fine fire. That's what it was. You can't warm by painted fire. That was fire one time, but what about fire now? Holy Ghost had power at Pentecost through the first age, second age, and all now. What about this age? He's the same Holy Ghost today. The same power, the same signs, the same wonders, the same miracles. If he can get the same kind of faith amongst the people, God doesn't change. There. What a time. Dark hour, the church has turned him out because they believed on Jesus and he had turned him down seemingly. My dark hour. But just at the darkest of hour, then Jesus come along. That's usually the way he does it. Just in the darkest of hour, Jesus comes along. Maybe it's your darkest of hours, sister. But Jesus comes along. 
may be sure darkness and hours. There's been women sitting there this week in wheelchairs, walk. There's been those who's on stretchers. There's been those who's been bound for years and so forth around the world, everywhere, up walking. Maybe it's yours with heart trouble, worst enemy that you got, and sickness. Maybe you can't live over another few days, but Jesus will come along just in the darkest of hour. He comes along. Now, when he comes along, things begin to change. Little Martha, she'd been kind of dilatory. And all the things in the world, but I got food and making tables ready. But you know, I kind of like her now. She, as soon as she heard Jesus come, here she started to see. Now, I see her pass by and say, Hey, they tell me that holy Lord. <laughs> he wasn't here when Lazarus died, was he? So we, we see him slipping back to town now if the funeral service is over. She just passed right on by. I believe that Martha had in her mind some scripture. And here's what I think she had. When the Shunammite woman in the Bible, when Elijah passed by and she was blessed and gave a baby, and the Shunammite woman, when she seen the baby had died, she said, saddle a mule now and go forward and don't you check unless I bid you. We're going to get to the prophet. And she knew that was God's representative. And if she could get before the prophet, she knew God was in his prophet. And if she could only get to that prophet, she would find out why her baby had died. She would know. So the husband said, oh, see the new moon or Sabbath, and he won't be up there, uh, up at the Mount Carmel. She said, all will be well, and away she went. And when he come in, oh, I hadn't told the prophet nothing about it. He just told Gehazi, said, here comes that shoot of mine. He said, our, our hearts grieve. God kept it for me. I don't know what's the matter with her. So he hollered, is all well with thee? All well with our husband? Is all well with the child? Now here's where I like her. She said, all is well. Settles it. The baby a corpse, her husband a screaming maniac, running up down the floor. Her heart jumping out of her, but all is well. I like that. <laughs> what was it? She was to the base of where she knows she'd find out from God what the reason was. She ran up to the prophet and fell down and revealed herself. She grabbed him by the feet. Of course, Jesus jerked her up. He kind of taken care of her watch. Nobody did such things. So Elijah said, Now, Jesus, you take my staff. Don't you go to talking to somebody on the road, but I go to give you a commission. You go lay this staff on the baby. And the woman, now, that would have worked, all right? If the woman would have believed that. That's where I think Paul got the handkerchief idea. Okay? Uh, Elijah know what he touched was left. So it wouldn't work for her because she didn't believe that. No, sir. She knew God was in the prophet. She didn't know about the sick. So uh, she said, as your soul lives, I'm not going to leave you. She stayed right with him. Well, he wasn't nothing to do. Put on his coat and take with her. And away they went. Out down to there. Got to the house. And I can just imagine seeing everybody in the yard weeping and wailing. That little 10, 12-year-old boy laying on the bed. And I want you to notice, she tucked him into the prophet's chamber. Good place to take him. Laid him on his bed. So old Elijah walked up and all that confusion and commotion around. He walked in there, walked up and down the floor, laid his body up on the little dead baby, sneezed seven times and come to life. Took the baby up. Now, no doubt, but what Mary or Martha had read that story, and she knew if God was in his prophet, surely he was in his son. So she knew if she could get to God's son, she would know why at that baby or brother had been taken. So she got over to him. Now when she looked like she had a right to scold him, a brave him, and say, why did you do a certain thing? Why didn't you come when we called you? But when she got to him, she fell down at his feet and said, Lord, if thou would have been here, my brother would not have died. See? She never scolded him and said, why didn't you come to this, that, or she did, the miracle wouldn't have taken place. It's your attitude towards, your approach towards the divine a working of God will determine what you'll get out of it. If you come and say, well, Lord of God, stand there and chew your tree, you come and say this. I'm the soul right to you, I'm the Holy Lord you doing. Oh, I didn't see nothing, sure. I, I never seen but it's a bunch of maniacs. But if you come to criticize, the devil will give you something to criticize. If you come for, to find good, God will show you something good. It depends on what you're looking for. So they come out. I could see her then she come up to him, she knelt down and said, Lord, if thou would have been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, whatever you ask God, God will give it to you. I like that. What you ask God, God's going to give it to you. Now, although he's dead, Lord, he's been dead four days. 
He's corrupted. His body is, is rotten. Skin worms are crawling in his body. Bugs just eat him up out there in the dirt. I know he's gone. All hope that way he's gone. But even now, Lord, whatever you ask God, God will give it to you. Oh, I like that. Even now, Lord, whatever you ask God, God will give it to you. If you people in this building today that's sick and afflicted, if you'll get your mind off the symptoms and get on to what God has said, it'll take place right now. Even now, Lord, I think of Jonah. If there ever was anybody in the world that really had some symptoms, it was Jonah. Don't you think so? That guy was on his road down to Nineveh. God told him to go to Nineveh, and he backslid and went over to Tarsus to get an easier road. And on the road down there, any backslidden preacher is going to cause some trouble. That's what's going to happen the world today. So the first thing you know, a trouble will come up. Jonah said, hey, you tie up my hands and feet and throw me out in the ocean, everything will be all right. So they picked him up, throw him out in the ocean, and the first thing you know, a big beast come by and swallowed him. I was talking to somebody about that the other day. They said, preacher, do you really believe that that, that beast, why well, I said, I can prove it that an orange can't go down a whale's neck. I said, well, I couldn't do it. I said, but this is a special feast God prepared. See, this is a good one. This one could swallow a man easy without any trouble at all. Reminds me of a little girl in that story. She used to come to the tabernacle. Oh, she was got saved down there and filled with the Holy Ghost. Her little face at the time. She was going up the street. Old man Darcy up there lived at Utica. Aunt Fidel to the core. He sent out her hoeing weeds on Sunday. And old clean used to made a patch out. This little girl come up the floor singing, Jesus loves me, this I know. Just a singing to the top of her voice. Mr. Darcy said, Hey, what are you doing? She said, How do you do, Mr. Darcy? He said, Praise the Lord, I just got the Holy Ghost. <laughs> he said, Nonsense. He said, Where have you been down there? Billy Branham will run you crazy. She said, Well, I just feel awfully good. So what you got in your arm there? She said, It's my Bible. Can you believe that story in there about the fish and the whale, or the whale swallowing Jonah? She said, yes, sir. She said, do you believe that, that the whale swallowed Jonah? She said, well, if the Bible said that Jonah swallowed the whale, I'd believe it. See? Whatever it was. She said, he said, nonsense. He said, how are you going to prove it any other way but by faith that that whale swallowed Jonah? Why, well, she said, when I get to heaven, I'll ask Jonah. That's exactly. Well, he said, then perhaps what if Jonah ain't there? So then you have to ask him. You'd be in hell, exactly. So you have to ask him. That's a good, that's a good question. That's a good thing. Instead so of Jonah's not in heaven, then you ask him. Because <laughs> if he were, he'd be. Oh, that's right, brother. And this Jonah, God told him, had him throw down the ship, and this whale swallowed him. I believe it. And oh, you're living here by the seashore. Or, uh, take your goldfish. When that fish feeds, he prowls through the water until he finds his prey. Then when he finds his prey, he goes down to the bottom of the uh, sea, spreads out his swimmers, and rests. The water's too deep, he's way out in the ocean, he skirts the top, of course. But when he's down at the bottom, when he's prey, he goes down to the bottom. Now this whale has swallowed Jonah. What a fix that whale was in. Had all that big stomach full of backslidden creatures. That's a whole lot for anything to stomach. And here he was, down there in the bottom of the sea. And here was this preacher, hands tied behind him, backslid. Talk about Simpson. He had him. Look, first place he was backslid. Next place he's on a stormy sea. His hands are tied behind him. He's in the belly of the whale, and the whale in the bottom of the sea. If he looked this way, it was whale's belly. If he looked that way, it was whale's belly. Everywhere you look, it was whale's belly. Talk about symptoms. That's worse off than any of you here this afternoon. He had symptoms, what I mean. But what did he say? He turned over in that vomit down there, got on his knees, seaweed wrapped around his neck. He looked at the whale's belly. He said, I refuse to see that whale's belly. There are lying vanities. He said, once more will I look towards your holy temple, O Lord. Hallelujah. What? Why? When Solomon dedicated the temple, the pillar of fire coming and settled behind it, Solomon prayed. He said, If thy people any time be in trouble and look towards this holy place, then you hear from heaven. And Jonah believed that God heard Solomon's prayer. And that old whale got so sick in his stomach so he vomited the preacher right up in Nineveh where he belonged. Is that right? Well, if Jonah, under both circumstances, Amen. Here it is. Get it. 
If Jonah, under those circumstances, backslid, hand tied behind him, the belly of a whale on a stormy sea down in the ocean, if he could refuse to see the whale's belly and believe that God heard Solomon's prayer, how much more ought you and I today to hear Jesus who has died and took his own bloody garments and sitting at the right hand of God, making intercessions on our confessions. What we say he's done, he's God's there to make it right. How much more ought we to refuse our symptoms? It's nonsense. I won't look at my crippled hand. I won't look at my, about my deaf ear. I'll look to your holy temple, Lord. Or Jesus stands at the right hand of God making intercessions on what I confess to be true. Amen. Say, I feel religious right now. I tell you I do. Look, just a little bit. Got to hurry. It's getting late. All right. Notice this. I can see then Martha, she goes out to meet Jesus. She falls down. That if thou would have been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, whatever you ask God, God shall give it to thee. Now look, there was a woman with a desire in her heart. She had come exactly the way God told her to, to his representative, which his representative at that time was his son. Today is the Holy Spirit. All right. Now the Holy Spirit will bear record of the Word. If it don't bear record of the Word, then it's not the Holy Spirit you're speaking to. Because the Holy Spirit feeds on the Word of God. Amen. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now, then here's a woman, heartbroken, all disturbed, but yet in her soul she was quiet. She got right where she knew that she could get some results. She said, if thou would have been here, my brother would not die. But even now, whatever you ask God, God will give it to thee. He said, Thy brother shall rise again. She said, Yes, Lord. I know he was a good boy. He'll raise in the general resurrection of the last days. I know he'll, he'll raise. He was a good boy. The Jews believe in the general resurrection. He said, He'll raise in the last days. I look at Jesus. Pulled his little frame together. He said, I am the resurrection and life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Said, believe us now then? Oh my. There's the question. Here's the woman, right place. The calls are coming right together. She's standing with God's representative. She's got a desire in her heart. And she's got the right man, the right place, the right attitude. And she's confessing, you are just exactly what you said you were. You're the son of God that was to come into the world. And I believe that whatever you ask God, God will give it to you because you are his representative. Brother, something's got to take place. Something has to take place. Said, I believe just exactly what you confess to be. I believe that's just what you are. I believe that you are just exactly what you said you was. He said, Thy brother shall rise again. And she questioned, said to the resurrection. He said, I am the resurrection life. He said, Believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. And, um, and uh, he said, Where has it believed thou this? He said, Yes, Lord. I believe that with all my heart. I believe that you are the Son of God that was to come into the world. Is that where you buried him? said, come see. The Bible said Jesus wept. I'm not trying to scold you, but here some time ago a Christian science woman said to me, said, Reverend Graham, said, your message is all right, but said, you put too much emphasis on Jesus Christ. You bragged too much about him. I said, how could I? I don't know how I could brag too much on him. She said, well, now look, said, you try to make him so divine and everything like that. When he was a good man, he was a teacher. I said, he was God. She said, he couldn't be God. I said, if he wasn't God, he was the biggest deceiver the world's ever had. Right. I said, he was either God or he was nothing. She said, well, he wasn't divine. I said, he was divine. She said, if I'll prove it to you by the Bible, will you accept it? I said, if the Bible said he wasn't divine, then I'll believe it. She said, I can prove it. I said, all right. She referred to this scripture. She said, when Jesus went down to the grave of Lazarus, the Bible said he wept. Now, I said, you mean to tell me that, that you think that's the reason he was divine? She said, well, sure, he wept. He was a man. I said, he was a man, yes, but he was God also. He was a God man. And she said, why, he couldn't have been. I said, he was. I said, look, he was a man when he was crying going down to the grave. But standing there brushing back those tears, out of Little eyes, he looked, so his hair back. Look over there and there, laid a man is in the grave, dead. His soul, four days' journey somewhere. His body rocked. The nose had done fell in. The hands had turned black and the bugs eaten through him. 
Then in there, pulled his little frame up because the Bible said there's no beauty we should desire him. Pulled his little step here, he wanted a great big seven footer. But he pulled his step together. He said, Lazarus, come forth. And a man that had been dead four days stood on his feet and lived again. I said, that was more than a man. That was God speaking out of his son. God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. you believe that? Yes, sir. There was a... One time he come down off the mountain. And he was hungry. Been up in Jerusalem, been fussing with him and everything. He come down, he was looking for something to eat. He went to a tree. There wasn't any fruit on that tree. And he couldn't find nothing. He was hungry like a man. And he couldn't find nothing to eat. But just after that, he'd taken five little pieces and two pieces of biscuit or something and fed 5,000 people. That was a man when he was hungry looking for something to eat on the tree. But it was God that taken those pieces, biscuits, and broken and fed 5,000. God was in Christ taking time the world to himself. Yes, sir. He was a man out there on that boat that night when he was fixed around like a little bottle stopper on the sea when 10,000 devils of the sea swore they were drowning. Him out there asleep, he was so weak, the virtue went out of him, and he was so tired from healing and going on that day, until uh, baby the devil said, we got him out of your seat, now we're down him. When he was laying back there in the waves, didn't even disturb him. He was a man when he was laying there on that boat asleep. But when he walked up there, when they were walking, he put his foot up on the rail of the boat, said, peace, be still, and the winds and the waves obeyed him. That was more than a man. That was God speaking to mortal lips, his son. Hallelujah! And what Christ was then, we have position in the same powers today, granted in Christ Jesus, for the faith of the church. Believe us thou this? He was a man when he cried at Calvary for peace or mercy from God. He cried, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was a man when he was crying. But, and when he died, he was a man. But when he rose on Easter morning, he broke the seals of death and hell. Brother, come forth, put his foot up on the devil's throat and touch the keys of death and hell, burst forth the grave and come out. He proved that he was God. Yes, sir. When he was on earth, he looked like God. He acted like God. He preached like God. He healed like God. He was God. God in the flesh. Yes, sir. Now, I believe Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do you believe us out this? I believe there's a woman one time that spent all of her money for a doctor. She could be cured of none of them. But down in her heart, she said, if I could ever get in contact with that man, I'd be healed. One morning, as you desire, so will it be. A little boat pushed into the bushes, and there was a little woman down there. Come down, touch the hem of his garment, is made well of her play. Believe us now this? I believe, a, I believe an old blind beggar stood on the street trying to beg for alms, and Jesus came by. He spoke to him and gave him his sight. I believe that same Jesus was then and today. You believe us now this? I believe that same resurrected Jesus Christ manifests himself here every night in power and signs and wonders. I believe this great commotion is going across the world now. It's called heresy. Says the people have lost their minds. This bunch of people is sold out to the world, burning every bridge behind them, and serving God, believing in signs and wonders and miracles, and the big formal church is saying they're crazy. I believe that Jesus Christ reincarnated in flesh in the human church here on earth, are doing signs and wonders. Believe us out there? I believe it on the day of Pentecost. Peter said, Repent every one of you and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you and your children to them as far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Believe us now this. I believe he's the same God that was back there, the same Holy Ghost that fell on the day of Pentecost is the same Holy Ghost that we feel right here now. Believe us now this. I believe the same power that preached the gospel all night by Paul when a man fell and killed himself and Paul laid his body over his body and he received life again. I believe that same Holy Ghost power is right there to fascinate a bunch of people that have made him sit hours after hours in an old hot building to listen to the glorious gospel of Christ. Believe us out there? Yeah. I believe he's the one that gives sight to the blind and hearing to the deaf and speech to the dumb. Make the lame walk. I believe he's right here now. The same God that he was then, same power he was then. I believe the same signs and wonders that took place then is taking place now. Believe us out there? I believe if every person in here right now would say, Jesus, I now accept you as my healer. I believe these women who raise up out of these wheelchairs walk out of the building. Believe us out there? 
I believe every man with a trumpet in his ear and every woman would pull it out and be made well if you'd accept him in that same power that is resurrection, proving his same signs. You can't sit half dead and believe some kind of a cold doctrine and then expect to get something from God. You've got to believe that he is and a reward of those who kill and seek him. I believe that he's here to perform everything that he promised to do. Leave us out in. How many sinners is in here today? I believe God will give you the baptism of the Holy Ghost right now. Believe us out in. I believe God will save every sinner, fill every saint, and fix us up for the rapture. Believe us out in. I believe that he would do it, and I believe that each one of you believe it. Now, I want you to watch. I want you to believe it with all your heart. Jesus, when he returned back, raised that dead man there to life again. His soul had been gone, returned back, lived in the flesh again. And many people went up to see Lazarus after he was raised from the dead. I believe that's only a chapter. I am so glad today. I don't know what to do to know that I have become a bosom friend of his. You've become a bosom friend of his. We've had associations with him. We are today having our fellowship with him right now. And our names are written on the same book that he called Lazarus' name from. I believe there will be a resurrection one of these days when all of those that are dead in Christ will God bring with him. Do you believe that? Then, brother, why can't we have an old-fashioned Holy Ghost meeting here in Palm Beach is what I'm wondering. Believe us out of this? I believe that each one of you right now, after seeing what you've seen, hearing what you've heard, seeing his power and manifestation, I believe that each one of you can go to your church and start a prayer meeting yourself. Believe us out of this? I believe you can turn this whole place in here and make this town so dry from whiskey that a bootlegger has to find itself an hour to get enough moisture to spit. I believe that's the truth. I hear on the police force and everything that the bootlegging whiskey and police cars and things are bringing in here. What the trouble is, they let down the bars and the churches. They got formal and they put out everything else, pollute the country. And members of the church drink, smoke, gamble, and live like the rest of the world. That's what broke communism loose in Russia. Believe us out this? I've been there. I know what I'm talking about. When they seen God perform miracles, them communists with tears running down their cheeks said, we'll accept the God like that. We believe that. Yes, sir. But because the church got away, got formal and indifferent and ungodly, got away denying the power there, just having a form of godliness. The Bible said they would have a form of godliness, but would deny the power thereof. I believe we're living in that time. Is that right? Believe us out this? They have a form of godliness, what would deny the power thereof. Now as the Holy Spirit is moving in here, moving over this audience, I believe that right now that anyone has a, a need of Christ, that God will grant it to you right now. I know my time's gone. Holy Spirit keeps shutting me. Tell me, go, how many have the need of God? Let's see you raise your hand. I wonder if there's a man or woman in here right out raw. Now look, I'm not one of these preachers that believes in this. Going around trying to pet and baby people to the kingdom of God, you make an illegitimate child. You can't come in out of the fire of gospel. Brother Peter, James, and John, them didn't pull any punches. They preached right out there and said, oh, you generation of hypocrites and so forth. John said, who's warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And brother, they come and was baptized with a score. There's got to be a time where you've got to put baby in people. You can't sissy find That's what the trouble of day preachers is handle a gospel with ecclesiastical gloves on. That's what the trouble of it today. What we need today is a raw, flat gospel telling you're a sinner going to hell. If you haven't got the Holy Ghost, you're out of the kingdom of God. That's right. You can't believe the supernatural because you have never been born again. And when you're born again, you have to believe the supernatural because you're supernatural yourself. Is there anybody in here that's a sinner? And wants to be man or woman enough to say, Preacher, I've been to the meetings this week. I've watched and seen. I'm convinced that I'm a sinner, and I want you to pray for me. Have you got grace enough to raise your hand? God bless you, lady. Someone else. God bless you, you, you. I want you preachers to look. You don't have to baby people around. Tell them the truth. That's what will stand at the day of judgment. God bless you, and God will save you if you're sincere in that. Anybody over here say, I'm a sinner. Preacher, pray for me. I want to be saved. Just raise your hand and say, I want to be saved. Raise your your hand. All right. In this side. Anywhere around. All right. How many years without the baptism of the Holy Ghost? Say, Brother Brandon, you pray for me. I want the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I belong to church. That's true enough. And I've accepted Jesus as my Savior. But I know I haven't got the Holy Ghost. Now you say, well, I believe I got the Holy Ghost. That isn't it. You know when you got the Holy Ghost. You don't get the Holy Ghost with some psychic workup. The Holy Ghost is a gift of God. And to you, my dear Baptist friend... 
You've been taught that you receive the Holy Ghost when you believe. That's a scriptural error. Acts 19, Paul preaching to a bunch of Baptists. Baptists, they were Baptists. They were John the Baptist. When he comes through the upper coast of death, he finds certain disciples. And he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since ye believe? They were disciples and followers. And look, friends, not only that, but they were shouting and praising God and having a great, joyful meeting. Let me tell you, that's where the world's stumbling right now. Look, they were having a great meeting. Apollos had been up there, a lawyer who had been converted and become a Baptist preacher. And he said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? They said, we don't know where there be any Holy Ghost. He said, how was you baptized? He said, under John, said, John only baptized unto repentance, saying that you should believe on them that has come. And him that was to come. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Paul laid his hands upon them. The Holy Spirit came up on them. They spoke in tongues and magnified God. Is that right? That's the scripture. I'm not responsible for nothing else but to say what God says. Now, you don't receive the Holy Ghost when you believe. You receive the Holy Ghost after you believe. You receive it after you believe. And it's the gift of God. No faith, no nothing else will give it to you. You can't just imagine you got it. You can't just accept it by faith. It's absolutely a work of God that comes down into the heart and makes known the presence of Jesus Christ. And when you receive the Holy Ghost, then you believe in all kinds of miracles and signs. And not only do you believe it, but you practice them. These signs shall follow them that believe. Repent, every one of you, and be baptized. Go into all the world, preach the gospel. He that believeth is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they'll cast out devils, speak with new tongues, take up serpents, drink daily things, lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. That is the sign of the believer. Believe us how this? That's what the Bible said. The last word Jesus said when he left the earth. Now, if those signs are not following you, then you're just imagining you are a believer. For Jesus said these signs maybe will follow. These signs shall follow. His last words and address to the church. May God help you while we bow our heads just a moment. Lord Jesus, flatly, bluntly, old-fashioned way, without any scholarship, without any strange tied earmarking, in a poor way, scattered out. But the Holy Spirit has tucked those words and beard them into the hearts of the people out here. There's men and women standing in this building who knows they're sinners and wants to be saved. They ask me to pray for them. For they've been here in the meeting and they've watched signs and wonders, great things taking place. And we know that they are believing. And I pray, dear Father, that you'll, right now, may they in their humble heart accept you as their Savior and be saved. There are those in here, Lord, who belong to church. Thou knowest my heart. We're not trying to tell them to leave their church. We're only trying to get them in such deep sincerity that you'll pour in the, the oil of Gideon, the bomb, and will make them so full of your spirit until they'll be so salty to the other church members who won't be like them. So full of power. When they get sick, they'll call for them to come pray for them. Oh, God, grant it. And when disputes are in the church, they'll be the ones who sit in the home and praise and seek God until it's all soothed out, covering it with prayer, with a hunger in their hearts to see the church of God move on. God grant these blessings to the people. We know that soon we're to pass from this life. We've got to give an account for our lives. And I ask you to be merciful to these. Now while we have our heads bowed, I wonder if those who are sinners and would want to accept Christ, now every head bowed, every eye closed, let this be the Holy Spirit and myself. I wonder if you just stand up to your feet. Say, Brother Branham, I've been here this week and seen signs and wonders through prayer of healing, miracles. I've been in the meetings. I've seen these great things happen around this place. The deaf hear, the blind see. The dumb speak. I, I, I want to accept Christ as my Savior now. Would you stand up? Just stand to your feet wherever you are. You say, I want to make a 
just now say in my heart, God knowing my heart, now as you you believe that he's there, now my spirit will not always strive with man. Now if you believe he's there, now it'll be twice as hard for him to come back again. Now will you stand and say, remember me, Brother Brown, I'm standing now. I'm wanting to accept Christ right now as my Savior. I'll turn my back on sin, and from this day on, I'm going to try to serve God. Sinners who doesn't know Christ, would you stand? Now those who have the, thank you, those who have the Holy Spirit, want the Holy Spirit, would you stand? Say, I want to accept the Holy Spirit. Thank you. Thank you. Good. All around. Both sinners and those seeking the Holy Ghost. All right. I believe God's going to grant it. Anyone else seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit wants to be remembered in prayer. God bless you, young man. Sinner, that's right. You're a sinner, that's right. God bless you. Just remain standing, if you will, just a moment. Now, Lord, don't let one of them perish. Please. You see them, you know them, and I pray that you won't let any of them perish. But may they become acquainted this afternoon with that Jesus who called Lazarus from the grave. Grant it, Lord, just now, may the Holy Ghost, who's present and all-powerful to do this work, I pray that you'll let him anoint them just now with great faith that'll bring the results down to their hearts. In Jesus Christ's name, I ask it. Now, while you remain standing, now those who are sick, stand up and say, Brother Branham, I need prayer for my body. Now, would you stand? You who are in need of prayer or your sickness. God bless you. What a marvelous time. What an hour. Just remain just a moment. Brethren, I want you to look over this audience, Brother Vail, Brother Bosworth, Jimmy. I want you to look over this audience, Lenny. I want you to walk up here with me and hold your hands towards that audience. Put your hands. Ministers up here, I want you to hold your hands towards that audience. Holy Ghost filled ministers everywhere, hold your hands towards the audience everywhere. Now I've either told the truth or an error. I have the Bible here to back up and tell me I've told the truth. The Holy Spirit's here. I believe that if each one of you will be sincere in your heart now, you will get just what you asked for. Now when Joshua crossed the river of Jordan, they marched around Jericho, and then they let out a shout, the walls of Jericho fell, and they went in and took the city. What do you want this afternoon? You want healing? Let's go in and take it. If you want healing, it's yours. God promised it to you. It's yours. If you want salvation, it's yours. But let's go in and take it. Now, let's everyone in his own way, with our head bowed, every person in here, in your own way, let's pray now. And you pray as I pray. Pray to God in your own way. Now, Heavenly Father, the Holy Spirit here present to give to each one of these people the deep desires of their hearts. Many of them are here as wanting salvation. They raised their hands and stood that they wanted salvation to their souls. I pray, God, that you'll fill each one of them with thy Holy Spirit, forgiveness of sins, and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I also pray, Lord, for all these sick people who are standing now, knowing that they're desperately in need and must have deliverance now. And we believe that you're here, you've ordained this day, you've ordained us to be here, and through this last eight or ten days, the signs, wonders, and miracles have taken place. And now, Lord, may each person here forget about all their differences and now accept you right now. May they say, I don't care what the world says. I don't care whether they call me a holy roller, whether they call me a religious fanatic. I am now coming to Jesus Christ in the power of his resurrection, and I'm claiming by faith right now my healing, my salvation. And, Lord, I'm going to give you praise like you did at Pentecost. I'm going to stand there and praise you and bless you until you give me what I'm asking for. I'm now committed to you, Lord. And in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, may the Holy Ghost drive back every power of the devil, and may each person be filled with God's presence in Jesus Christ's name.